Welcome everyone to the July 28th special meeting of the Auburn School Committee. Would you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, let's begin with introductions, please. Pam Hart, Ward 2. Karen Matthew, Ward 3. Brian Belknap, Ward 4. Dan Poisson, Ward 5. Dave Fontaine at large. Dave Simpson at large. Brian Carrier, Mayor's Rep. All right, thank you, everyone. Next one, uh, next item on the agenda this evening is communications. Would anyone have any communications they'd like to share this evening? We've, I want to say, we've, I think we've continued with the full spectrum. I know my inbox and text messaging is with the with the um, same wide spectrum of please open the doors five days a week um, to please don't open the doors and there's a myriad everywhere in between there um, students uh, staff family members parents uh, teachers uh, bus drivers we've kind of run a myriad if anyone else has another communication I just want to make sure that we are getting your communications yes uh, your pop your check your mic Heard a lot of positive feedback about the EL forum, mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad that we're getting that information out there and answering parents' questions. And it's very important because there's still a lot of questions, and we all have questions. So I'm glad those are happening because I think it's very important. Um, I've been getting a lot of information. Well, a lot of um, texts from teachers. A lot of them are very um, leery about the the plan. Um, a lot of them are nervous. They, for their safety, as far as um, going back into the schools, the logistics involved. Um, I know that they've had a couple Zoom meetings with Michelle and Shelly, and um, they just have a lot of logistic questions, and um, they just aren't very comfortable with what is being presented. That's what I've gotten. All right, anyone else like to share? Yes, Mr. I'm, Simpson. No, I'm just gonna, I've gotten, I told you, I've gotten where I usually don't get calls, texts, and emails. I got a ton of them today, and there was the consistent message in the ones I received was they hate the plan, they want to go back to school. That this was is based on the EL, the EL meeting. This information last night. I didn't even have access to because I didn't do the forum last night. Apparently, they reduced the, the actual classroom time. Um, so it was just as a balance, or just to let himself be true, it was across the board. We want to go back to school. Thank you so much, um, and we want to really maximize that in-person time. It's, it's first and foremost in our minds um, with safety. All right, oh, I'm gonna open it up to public participation this evening. If anyone is here who would like to speak publicly on something that is not on the agenda tonight, you feel free to use the podium and come on up. All right, close part of public participation. So we're gonna move on to the reason we are here this evening, which is to hear a presentation um, around some distance learning systems and also to hear um, a little bit about the COVID relief funds. So we're gonna turn it over to the powers that be who are here for the presentation this evening. Thank you very much. It's uh, my pleasure to share with you some information that came late last week from the Maine Department of Education regarding the CRF funds. These are the COVID relief funds that the governor mentioned in her address the week before. Um, the formula for the distribution of those funds had, hadn't been developed when the uh, commissioner had her press conference and went out last Thursday. So to give you a sense of what they are, they are highly regulated. They can only be used between March of 2020 and December of 2020. It's a very narrow window. There's a very narrow list of things that the money can be used for. There is a good Q&A they sent out on Friday regarding use of the funds. For example, can they be used as a revenue? The answer is no. Can you use them for things that were in your budget? And the answer is no. Um, so they really have to be in some way connected to expenses that were incurred for COVID. The other emphasis that the department is placing upon the use of the funds pertains to technology. I know that sitting in the finance committee last Thursday, I believe it was Adam, that we talked about the importance and appropriateness of one-to-one -one technology and that even with Herculean efforts last fall, I'm sorry, last spring, we still weren't there. And I asked Mr. Robinson what we needed to do 
and he shared with me the number of devices that we need to get to ensure a one-to-one -one in the event that we need to go a full remote um, instructional method again. And so with that, one of the opportunities that we have had presented is to think a little outside the box. And I'm going to turn it over to Peter and to queue up something for you to see. One of the challenges for school districts is to try to figure out how to connect with families who are at home. And this is a company who is doing just that. And Peter, if you would airplay the, uh, the video, we're going to show you about five minutes of a what's called a Pro-AV system, which is a combination of video, technology, and a one-to-one. -one. Thanks, Peter. Start off, my name is Mary. I am the K-12 um, market manager here in Massachusetts, and Jay's here next to me. So I'm going to first, I'm going to um, explain what our classroom looks like, the size and dimensions of it, and um, walk through the system, and then I'll kind of show you how the teacher's going to use this system. This solution here is meant for the teacher to be in her classroom with, you know, whether her kids are all remote or half of them are here, and it just makes everybody feel like they're in class and they're, they're a group, like they're supposed to be. Um, so right now, my classroom, uh, 28 feet back, you can see the back wall there with the two panels, that's 28 feet back. My PTZ camera, which I'll show you here in a moment, is mounted on the wall back there. And then width-wise, it's 22 feet wide. I have one single microphone up here in the ceiling, and then we have an Epson Bright Link in the front of the classroom as our technology solution. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna change the camera. Now I have an interactive projector. I'm not sure what you guys have. So I'm gonna just change everything here through my whiteboard. Um, but if you don't have an interactive solution, then the teacher would obviously do it on her PC. That's my laptop camera. Yeah. And here's the PTZ camera. So again, this is mounted 28 feet back from the projector. Um, this is what we call home mode. Um, so, you know, classes come in, it's just focused on the whiteboard. Um, but I like to, I'm not sure how many schools are still doing the Pledge of Allegiance, but, you know, we're going to start off the class every day with the American flag, do the Pledge of Allegiance. The people at home have the American flag so they can do the Pledge of Allegiance as well. Um, and then, uh, so what Jay's doing right now is he has a remote in his hand and he's just doing my presets for me. Um, this small remote has over 100 presets. Um, so he's gonna go over to this whiteboard that I have here on the left side of the room. And this whiteboard, it has our design of the system, but the teacher could have an agenda or another space in her room that she wants to focus on. So here is the design. So everybody pretty much has a projector or display. If not, it would be quoted. Um, everybody should have some sort of a teacher interface plate with HDMI, uh, VGA, and um, USB. If you don't have USB, this would be added to the system. Um, and then audio is up here, speakers. So pretty much what we're adding into the solution is this conferencing hub, the rear camera, and then the microphone. And I'll have Jay move the camera over to the microphone right now. It's a small round circle in a ceiling tile above. You see how it's green right there. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna mute myself. And it turns red. So that just shows that the teacher knows that, you know, no audio is going to those remote students. Um, I, we have another teacher interface over here. Um, it's a preset. This could be like in a science lab or anything like that, but you know, the teacher is just holding this remote. Here, we'll go back to the whiteboard and I'll show them. So here's this remote. It's a small remote, just regular TV remote. And she's just toggling through her presets. Uh, we can bring it to each student so you can have each student on the camera. Um, that way, you know, the kids at home can see the student talking. Thank you. That's pretty much the quick overview of it. Anybody have any questions? Does this 
system work with any platform as far as video conferencing? Is it just yep. an external camera essentially? Yep, so um, what I told you in the design, it has um, HDMI and USB, so you should probably have one if you already have a front of the um, room technology, but I just have HDMI and USB. So you can run Zoom, you can run Google Meet, you can run Teams. We're just doing Teams just because we're a corporation and that's what how we book our rooms um, with, but any platform it will work with because it's just HDMI and USB. Any other questions? I can get into, you know, like, so we can go into a little bit of the lessons just so you can see. Um, so Jay here, one of the class, classmates in the class, he's gonna share something. So everybody, and you want to do um, the zoom into the screen? One screen share. So everybody from home, you know, Jay's in class, he's sharing. Um, one of you guys that are remote that's not in the class, you guys can screen share something, um, you know, and everybody in the class can see it if they're not joined on their laptops remotely. So it really just gets everybody remotely part of the class and everybody in the class able to see those kids at home along with the teacher as well. Feedback, we're happy to take any feedback, um, any thoughts, any questions. Um, just wondering like if Jay talks, how does the mic pick him up? Or was it Jay in the room with you? Yep, yep. I'm right here. How do you, how does it sound now? Okay. He's That's gonna move to the back of the room. So we're pretty, we're underneath the mic when we're up here at the front of this room. Um, so he's 20 feet back, so I'll let him say something. So I'm in the back corner of the room as far as I can go. Mm -hmm. At that sound. Sounds good. Um, one question. Can, just for kicks, can you kind of cover your mouth a bit and talk? Uh, no, I was just saying. You know, people wearing masks in the fall. Is this so. any better? I have my arm over my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the mic's pretty good, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, and the cameras are presets, not, it's not tracing. Is there a tracing camera option as far as that would follow the speaker? Yeah, so so there are um, speaking tracing solutions. We've tested them. And if you put, you know, there's like the, the owl, the swivel, um, there's one other one that we tested. If a student drops a book or if a student backs up their chair, that owl is gonna go right to that noise and it's gonna take the focus off of the teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, so we didn't choose that as a solution just because we wanted the teacher in control of her classroom and her lessons. Um, and this, you know, the, the camera is probably one of the, the cheaper item, items of it. Um, and we also, you wanna, we'll show you the conferencing hub. So there's different solutions on how you can mount the conferencing hub. He's gonna see that black little box right there next to the projector. That's the conference. Right now, all I'm seeing is um, MF. Oh, hold on, sorry. <laughs> all right. That's better. So that black little box, it's actually dark blue, but that's right next to the projector. That's the conferencing hub. So that's what your projector is going into, and then it's going out to the HDMI and USB. So you can mount that right up there. Um, there's also, you can put it in the ceiling, you can put it um, on a shelf on the wall, but that's, that's your mini DSP. So that's controlling the audio and the um, camera switching and it has AEC so the students that are remote they're not being heard um, back at themselves when they're in the classroom speaking into the classroom. And so with your setup right now the only thing you're connected to is the USB port from the wall plate is that correct yeah. 
Yep, H HDMI to get my image up to the projector and then USB for the interactivity of the projector and and share, now that you've had a chance to actually see, this is interactive technology that would allow students who are home or working remotely to actually be part of the classroom. And Peter is here to answer some of the technical questions. Um, I can answer some of the practical ones and then Adam and I can both answer some of the cost. Questions? Um, so one of the first questions I have is, um, does it have the ability to record? So if I'm a student remotely, but I can't get what I'm on what I'm supposed to, can I have access to recording of this so later? Whichever platform we use, and it would probably be Zoom, um, all of those have the ability to record as part of the platform. So it wouldn't be the system that's recording, it's the conferencing platform, but yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, is this, so I imagine, um, Potentially something like that. I'm just thinking of our buildings. I'm thinking in particular of our high school and wanting to be leery with what we're putting into the high school. Is this uh, transferable to the new the new high school? Could this technology be picked up and brought with us? Yes. So we're looking at that hub on the wall, the microphone in the ceiling, and the camera, and and the wires that go along with it. So yes, it's it would be transferable. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? <laughs> um, Go ahead, it's yeah. probably not a technical question, but it's about like privacy issues. I know that, that that's kind of something that I've been hearing too with FERPA. If we have a camera and there are students in the class, is that a violation of privacy or is that a non-issue? a great question. I don't think it's a violation of privacy because okay. there's nothing that would go on in the classroom that would... Um, I mean, all the students who are there are publicly there, okay. right? Uh, and and I'm going to look to you, Peter. Have we had privacy questions about other recording devices? No, I mean, this is, this is certainly not something we would be putting out on the public web. It's clearly not, even if we have the recordings, they'd be only, only accessible to the students within the class, so really, the only people who are looking at this are the students and the teacher who would in a normal year be together in that room anyway. Um, we would certainly want to be very careful with those recordings because clearly if those were to be accessible publicly then that would be a problem. Not only, not only publicly but we don't know who's in the homes with the kids while they're watching it on, based on, you know what I mean, we are not letting parents sit in the classroom but maybe their cousin or uncle's sitting there watching other kids in the class. I guess that would be my concern on Pam's question. Yeah, I, think, I think in my mind we'd need that legal issue really firmed up a little tighter. Um, from have waivers that every parent yeah. signs. I don't know how that works. Mm -hmm. but. Um, well, I know I'm thinking I've got my parent hat on and we have to sign, you know, the ability to, to mm -hmm. video your child when they're in school yeah. or Paper. put their picture on the website yeah. or yeah. things like that. I'm thinking... Um, that, that's certainly something we would want to make sure we have, we've organized that piece of it. I think with Zoom, um, at least with, with us, so when we do a Zoom meeting at work, every time you get into the Zoom meeting and they record it, you have to consent to being recorded okay. or you can't get in. It actually kicks you out. Um, so if we're using Zoom, and that may okay. provide us that, that ability. legal insulation. That's okay. true of Google Meet, too, which would be the alternative platform. Yep. Okay. But I'm eight years old, so somebody has to manage that for me, right? I'm, like, putting on my, my – I'm in third grade. Who manages that for me? Or is that one of the – I think that's a – I think that's something we have to figure out. Um, in my mind, we do. And I want to make sure I'm understanding this straight. So this is my ability as a student to zoom into my classroom and to really be a part of my classroom digitally it's not the ability for me to, um, like I'm thinking of the main learning platform that the DOE is pushing out, uh, where I just hook on to all kinds of videos and it's not my class, not my teacher, this is my teacher, this is my classroom, these are my classmates. Exactly. The, the idea being that you have half the students physically present in the classroom and the other half, to whatever extent possible, would be participating via video conferencing in real time. So the teacher would essentially have to plan one class for everybody instead of having to plan 
in class activities and at home activities separately. I like that a lot. I think it's, it's much easier for a teacher to, to focus on one thing as opposed to a, a bunch of things. And I think also too, like you said, because my confusion last week um, was if you have a teacher teaching one group of cohorts and then the other group of cohorts the same thing, well, when does the remote learning happen? So this kind of demonstrates where the remote learning is happening at the same time as the in-person learning. So I like that a lot. That's a, a beautiful assessment because this really is the definition of remote learning. And if you think beyond COVID, because eventually COVID will end, the promise of what this could bring to schools, if someone is home because they have been hospitalized, if they have been sick for the day, if they have to be away, this would allow you to be in your classroom in real time. One of the things that we've talked a little bit about at the administrative level is that we don't want kids to be on laptops five or six hours a day. We don't, we don't think that's particularly healthy. And Peter, you had a, a great um, response for that. I did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, Don't I, you I wish mean, it was recorded, huh? <laughs> I do, actually, now. I'm trying to think what I said that was so good. I, I mean, I just said to me, it's, it's common sense that we wouldn't expect our students to sit in front of a video conference all day. Um, I think we as adults struggle with that. Um, I know, you know, I've been in an awful lot of Zoom meetings over the past several months. I'm sure most of you have. And it's quite hard to stay as focused as you do when you're physically pr present in the room. So I think teachers would have to find some ways to do an activity that would be whole group instruction and then the class might sort of split up and go do things on their devices, whether it's at home or in class, and then come back to the meeting after some period of time when they've been working on things independently. The other thing that we've been thinking about administratively is the age appropriateness of a device like this one, of a tool. And what I'd like to do, if you consent to rolling it out tonight, is ask for some volunteers and maybe start with the upper levels and see if they're interested in um, piloting. I don't like the word pilot necessarily, but trying to roll this out with teachers who are interested in experimenting with technology, with this particular technology. Um, we also know that the high school kids tend to be more independent than some of our little kids. So again, that's, that's a very preliminary thought about how we might begin to operationalize this. The other challenge that we have is that this is July 28th, right. and in order to even begin to roll out an implementation of this, the supplier has said that they will work with us as quickly as they can, but we have to be realistic in terms of the number of classrooms that they can do and get ready for the beginning of the year. So that, that makes a you know, volunteer um, approach perhaps even, even more attractive to us to get that in place. Um, just to give you some financials, I had promised I'd tell you how much it is. This is roughly $5,000 a classroom. We did the rough math and to do 300 classrooms, which is about the number of classroom teachers we have, not counting uh, things like um, special education or librarians or guidance counselors because they're all part of that unit, we get to about 300. And so the, the rollout for this with the um, laptops is going to be about $2 million. We have $2.9 million coming from the CRF funds. And again, we have to use that or we will lose that by the end of December. Um, they've been pretty clear without that. It appears that there will not be, as you have with other federal grants, carryover. So we're, we're going to have to have it spent. Um, questions about the, the finances there? Is there any upkeep to that, like software purchases, the licensing? Great question. Peter, how about you take that one? So um, we certainly need to figure out what we're going to do for a video conferencing platform once Zoom stops its current free offering that it's doing while, while the COVID situation is ongoing. I'm working on getting pricing from Zoom and from Google for their equivalent on Google Meet, which I think is going to be less expensive than Zoom. Um, we would pay for that certainly for the current year out of this same money. Um, then we obviously have to figure out what we wanted to do beyond that. 
And one of the finance committee members, I apologize for not remembering who it was, might have been Brian, asked about insurance going forward for the, the devices. So I've um, looked at three options. Um, Apple actually has coverage that they provide. Um, it's three years for $49, um, and that includes two incidents of breakage per year with no, um, no fee per incident. Um, we've also dealt with AGI, which is another company that is in that same sort of insurance space. Um, they have a three-year option for $39, um, and there, as far as I know, no, no incident limit with them. So that seems like it would be the, the best option of the ones that I've looked at. Thank you. And these 1,100 devices are, what, what types of devices are they? They are the, they're iPads, the same as the ones that we currently have um, at a ratio of two students per iPad. Mm -hmm. This would bring us to one to one K through, pre-K through six. And additional keyboards, Peter? Keyboard, yes, uh, rugged keyboard cases. And the plan would be to take the iPads with the keyboards, put them in the upper elementary grades, probably four through six, so that the students who are writing more would have keyboards rather than having to type on the, on the glass screen of the iPad. And that would be cheaper than getting them computers? Um, it comes to about $400 a device, which is about the same as what you'd pay for any kind of a reasonably constructed computer, whether it's a Chromebook or a PC. And Peter, remind me, the Chromebook warranty is not as competitive as Apple's? Um, the thing with Chromebooks is that they are, if you can buy very inexpensive Chromebooks, but they are very inexpensive and they fall apart and you end up replacing them sometimes multiple times during the course of a school year or constantly repairing them. Um, they also have almost no residual value. Once you start putting them in service, they, they don't hold their value. You have no option at the end of two or three years to sell them to a remarketer and then take that money and put it into a refresh. So if we look at total cost of ownership, um, the $400 iPad and keyboard is, is the best deal we're going to find. Peter? Excuse me. Peter, um, uh, what's the cost of the, the keyboards that we're looking? We're going to move the keyboards that we currently have upwards uh, to the upper grades. But, if we had to purchase more of those to fill out the upper grades. Sure. So, so currently we don't, have a, we don't have any keyboards with the iPads. They're not in keyboard cases at all. So what we'll do is we'll buy these 1,100, put those in the upper grades with keyboards, and then take the ones without keyboards and have those in the lower grades. The keyboard is $70 per unit for the, the ones that I'm looking at right now. Any other questions right now from the committee? All right. Oh, 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 oh. sorry. Yeah. So she has someone that's, that's filming her. Are teachers going to need someone to film them, or can she, is that going to be working on them? I know she didn't want to do the owl, but... She, she just had him using the remote to move. The camera has presets. Okay. So the remote, basically, you just press a button on the remote, and it moves the camera to a, a location in the room. There's also a manual control, where it's sort of like a joystick, where you could move it around manually. But the idea is that you'd have presets so that if you're teaching at the front of the class, you just push that button, it's, it's pointed at you, you do your thing, Maybe then you're having a student discussion, so you, there's another preset that takes in the whole group of students, and you can see that. So it's really not something that you need a, okay. se a second person to manipulate the camera. That's a great question. Okay, there. yeah, because I, I, I figured it would be a lot easier if she could do it or mm -hmm. he could do it by themselves. Thank you. And sure. Peter, I did catch the option that if I'm having, if I need to have a conversation with someone in my classroom, but I don't need everyone else to have the con hear the conversation. I can mute myself so that I can have a... a, a yes, and, and you saw the microphone, that it was, turns okay. red, so that the teacher knows immediately that the students in remote can't hear. And you can mute the video too, I mean, it's just the same as within Zoom, when you, you stop your video, you stop, you, you mute yourself, works exactly the same way. Okay. All right. Yes, Brian. One other question that goes back to the tech issue. We're watching this in, you know, they're all in technically real time. What happens if you lose your audio? Do you still have the capability to type in questions to the teacher so that she'll know that you're... Platform. So, so again, part of whichever platform we're using, be it Google Meet or Zoom, is the chat function, the text chat, so p students could be using that. And, I mean, if I, w if I were thinking about training teachers on how to use this, I would encourage them to use that as a parking lot for students to type in questions at any time, and then, you know, they can sort of go through that at a later time.
So if I, if I might, thank you, just pick up on that. Peter, we should share a little bit about, if this goes forward tonight with the support of the school committee, the opportunity to train volunteers from teacher volunteers and what that might look like. So I, I envisage um, talking to our sort of technical tech reps in each building, um, obviously our, our coaches as well, and identify some volunteers at a, a variety of levels, certainly focusing uh, on the high school, middle school, but I think we could go down into some of the elementary classrooms as well. Um, get those installations done as quickly as Pro AV can, can come in and do that. Um, and then start those teachers using this system and finding out what are the things that we need to share, the do's and don'ts that we can share with the rest of uh, the staff who maybe perhaps weren't quite as willing to jump in head first on day one. Thank you. The other beauty about this system is that it's not building dependent. In other words, you don't have to do an entire building. You could do part of one and then part of another. It's not comparable to a, a network. Right. It's, it's self-contained within each classroom. There's no centralized equipment that you need to install beyond the network that we already have. Um, it's just set up in each classroom individually. Thank you. So if a student loses connection, because um, I know I did that, that happened to me a lot with the Zoom when we would have meetings, and I'd have to use a hotspot on my phone. So let's say that happens. Um, you said the classes are recorded. So how would, because that was one of the questions actually my son asked me. What if we lose connection? How do you get back to the class? Um, how would you fix that? So I, I think we'd, we would put those, make the videos available through Google Classroom for the upper grades, Seesaw for the younger grades, that, because that way it's contained within that class group so that only the people who are part of that class have access to it. Okay, sounds good. All right, school committee members, at this time I'm going to open this up to public participation. If we have anyone who would like to come up and publicly speak on this topic, please come to the podium. Hi there, welcome. Hello, I'm Maureen Edgerton. I teach, I teach chemistry at the high school. Um, we've got several questions. Some of them are technology questions that Peter could help us with. Others are classroom management. And I've kind of lumped them together. I'm gonna have to take this off to speak. Alrighty, so in terms of technology, Will there be enough tech support in the building if the system start, stop, stops working? Mm -hmm. Would we be spending time that we should be teaching trying to get the machine up and running? And um, I mean, we, you, you know our tech support resources. Um, we, will, we will hopefully have the same level of support that we've had in previous years, so there'll be somebody at each building. Okay. Um, we're Full time on at that each right building. Now. Yeah, so it's, so I mean, I, I I don't see this as being a system that's going to require a great deal of support. It's, it's a very robust setup. It's not a complicated, there's not a lot of software in the background. It's really mm -hmm. Zoom that you're running on your laptop and mm -hmm. teachers are very familiar with that already. So I don't see there being a huge challenge. I think we will always have challenges on the other end, on the student side. Um, as Pam said, you know, students are going to lose connection sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, we've certainly had challenges with supporting students in, in full remote mode, which we met. So even if a student is in remote mode on one day, at least they're now coming into school so we can actually get hands on their device, whereas last spring we were dealing with it where they weren't coming in at all. Thank you. Um, if families are using a hotspot, will there be enough bandwidth for multiple children on a hybrid plan to be using it? That will depend entirely on the hotspot and the vendor and how close they are to a cell phone signal. It's, it's a slightly unanswerable question. Um, we'll ob we obviously have two different types of hotspot and if we're finding that a student is struggling with one, we'll try the other one and see if we can get them a better signal. Okay. In terms of classroom management, I can see high school and perhaps middle school students sitting there in the classroom, even if they're remote, but classroom management with the little folks, how do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them from running around the room? Um, you, can't, you can't pull them back on task the way you might with those signals in the classroom. So if this is to replace remote, uh, 
remote education that's not direct instruction, then how would that work? So we're talking the youngest we would have and make sure, I want to make sure I have this right. So because I was a 25 year kindergarten teacher, so I know where you're going, <laughs> but our, our pre-K to second graders are in the buildings with us. This has nothing to do, am I correct? Um, only for ex mm -hmm. extenuating circumstances um, might some of our youngest learners do this. So in, in my mind, third grader um, eight-year-olds are really, it, uh, when we talk about our youngest ones, I just want to make sure we're, when we define youngest, that I've got the grade level straight in my mind yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And the other thing, um, students who are the, the third through whatever, if parents are working and those students are at daycare or some kind of um, program because they're not at home, will they be able to do this? Will they be able to join their classroom if they're in a daycare setting or some kind of day camp? Um, Maureen, I'll, tr I'll try to tackle that one. I think that's going to require pretty close coordination as it always would between the schools and the family's daycare program. Um, I think the daycare may welcome some structure like this and for the kids to do things, um, but we would need to coordinate with those providers and offer this, again, with the volunteers of teachers and say, we'd like to make this available. How can we partner with you to provide this as an opportunity for the kids? If I could follow up, if there's uh, a situation where that doesn't work out, isn't there a risk of the student falling further behind? If their class kept going on the two days that they weren't there, and for whatever reason they couldn't join remotely, is that student going to lag behind the rest of the classmates and have to play catch up? I think that situation probably presents itself under any scenario, that you're going to have kids who, for whatever reason, are um, given circumstances out of their control, may not be able to keep up with their class. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that even in pre-COVID days, that happened. Mm -hmm. Would we be looking at perhaps remote packages the way the teachers did this spring for students who are chronically unable to join? I think that's a, a great question. I know that the um, instruction committee, as headed by Shelley, is taking a look at what that, what separate from this, what that instruction model is, is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Also, you said that there's going to be recordings of the classes. So to answer that, I'm wondering if that can be, I mean, uh, utilized as something to help with the gap. Once the parent, once the once child the is, out is home, day, home from daycare. Yes, yeah, home from daycare, then they can look at whatever happened during the day and do it that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, it seems like that's something that could work. That's right. In terms of um, if you're having a discussion, you've got half the class remote, half the class in the classroom, will they be muted? Would it be... I, I realize now, I didn't quite understand that before that we'd be basically using this system with a platform like Zoom. So you'd probably have to set ground rules and whatnot. But if a student is not engaging, the student is there or wanders off or isn't paying attention, that classroom management piece, some people voiced concern they wouldn't have that hands-on classroom management um, trying to get, elicit the students' responses and contr contributions to the discussion, as well as um, you could, I suppose, just mute a student who's, who's out of turn, but that's not very, <laughs> we don't like to mute our students. So um, just something to think about in, in terms mm -hmm. of expecting half of our students to be in their classroom remotely. Um, in terms of our ELL population, um, and as much uh, the regular ed population as well, what kind of training will there be for parents to make sure they understand that this is more than just a Zoom meeting, that this is uh, expected participation, expected attendance, etc., cetera, um, and instruction for um, Again, those, those parents who are uh, not necessarily as willing to play along with us. 
will there, will there be parent meetings or trainings? One of the things I've learned in my 28 days in Auburn is that it's very important to connect with families in the community and that the eight forums that were scheduled as part of the reentry to school project have been very, very well attended. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't see why this isn't something that we do the same for. Mm -hmm. um, what about students in special ed programs who need one-on-one -on -one attention or more? Um, they're not going to be successful sitting at home in front of their laptop. I think the rollout for this, if, if the school committee approves this particular initiative, will have to be done judiciously and it may not be for some of our specialized populations, that this may not lend itself to that particular delivery of information. Um, talking with Ryan, we may have to get creative about how to deliver services off-site. Off um, we're talking with our classroom teachers, both gifted and talented, and some of the other pull-out programs that we have. Do we, when kids are in on their two days, are those the two days that they get their services? Or do we try to deliver them remotely on a, on a different day? You know, trying to capitalize again on their in-person time as much as possible. But we're also looking at some of those specialized populations being in four. school four days a week and right. they would rather than being in an A or B cohort, Correct. they I would also, be yeah. in the building. Four days. Yeah. I also know of some special ed teachers who were very successful in using Zoom last spring when we were in full remote mode. They were having daily meetings with, with their students and, mm -hmm. and were being very successful with it, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, so they certainly modified as needed, but it, it can be done. So apparently there are case studies showing that this can be very successful at um, the college level and with business and industry where you expect the students or the employees to be a little more self-sufficient. Is there any kind of data on using this in a primary school, elementary, high school? Is this, are we at the forefront doing this or is there any kind of I think we're in, we, we, not just we, but we and big we nationally, yeah. globally, are, are entirely new territory here. Is this a brand new system the, the, program or? The, this, the hard, hardware wise, no. That's, I mean, that's tried and tested technology, as, as you've, you said. It's, you know, well used in industry right, and, right. And, and higher education. But I think, you know, the model we've always been used to is K-12 students come to school five days a week and we, educate them in school, and now we're having to find ways to do that differently. So it's, I think we're all breaking new ground here. And I heard something earlier tonight about, you know, maybe we do this in perpetuity where students absent and they can watch it on the, uh, they can watch whatever they missed. And I'm just wondering, I know those, the privacy waivers and whatnot, but to have every single minute of a teacher's day on camera is going to be very intimidating for some people and um, I think just it, those subtle redirections for example when you'd go over to a student and just lean over and whisper you know do that's on film everybody's going to know oh look she had to speak to that student and what if that student's parent gets very upset because now everybody else saw that that student had to be spoken to. I'm a little worried about the privacy concerns in that way and you know even in class discussion if a student raises their hand answers a question gets something wrong we're doing formative assessment constantly um, on that informal basis and I'm just wondering are the students going to be less hesitant to participate because it's now on t on video and everybody can see it um, just concerns like that, I think, are something that we really need to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So those were, were great questions. Um, I think everything that um, Mrs. Edgerton came and relate to us is, in, it's real. These are things that are percolating in, in educators' minds. Um, and I know as an educator myself in this, in this day and age and time, it just can't feel like it's something else I have to try to figure out, right? So I can appreciate the volunteering, 
the rollout um, as, a, as a volunteer platform um, as I think about my classroom. So um, it's definitely something to, um, to be thinking about. But at this point, yes, Dave. Question to Dr. Brown. I think, um, and you'll have to educate me on this, but if we were to go with this platform at Edward Little High School, why would we need to amend the school day at all? That's an excellent question. I think it would pertain to how many volunteers we had at Edward Little High School who operationalized this. My other question is if for the virtual learners, what level of accountability is there going to be for the instructors? I brought this up the last, the last school committee meeting that last spring was not rainbows and ponies for a lot of kids. It really wasn't. There was absolutely no oversight of what, what was happening. More importantly, what wasn't happening, and I fear this is we're we're feeding into the DOE's big picture. This is where they want us to land anyway. Um, so my my question is, first of all, why don't we, if we're going to do this platform, I'm really familiar with this through some classes I've taught. It's a good platform, regardless if it's Zoom or it, whatever it is. But as far as the the functionality of it, um, I don't understand the need to condense my senior in high school school week to two four hour days if he can three days a week sit at home in his bed and go to period one two you know right through the school day i don't understand the need to amend that um, i i think it certainly opens up a lot of opportunities to um add to the model that you are considering right now for the re-entry to school Aren't we doing that because we're trying to keep the groups small? Is that what you mean? Like the reason they're going to two days as opposed to four days, it's to keep the group small, the cohort small? Is that what you mean? My point is you can have a class that starts Monday morning at 745. At Every home. kid assigned to that class can participate in that class. So my question is, so why are we backing off the school week to four days? Actually, so my son Connor would go to school two four-hour days. Why couldn't he go to school five days. He'd be at home, three of them. Doing well, he would be. That's, that's my understanding, is that even though my son goes to school for two days, that Wednesday is the cleaning day, so we're off that day, and then Thursday and Friday, they're still going to school, but they're going to school at home. It's a remote learning, and they're still learning. Doing four one-hour blocks, Pam. My question yeah. is, why can't we just start at 745 and go to 210, or 215, whatever the school year was prior to March 16th? You want him to go to six hours, is that what you're saying? Regular school day. I just, I, that's my question. But the only thing that would change is that two days they'd be in the school, two days at home, but it would be, I, they're I'd all their same period. I'd like to see him in school like five days a week. I know that's not my call and I respect that, but I'm just saying it's like we're, we're, we're crunching everything down. Do we need to? Do we really need to do that? I don't know. This is a great, I mean, this has my support. So I think that's a, that's, so something then that the um, reentry committee will want to really be thinking about then is that we want to, if we want to maximize in-person learning and we want to maximize their time in the building, can 60 minute blocks be opened? At, like if, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth, Dave, um, but like can 60 minute blocks be opened up longer? Can, you know, the, but those are conversations I think as we keep hearing about what the reentry plan is to keep um, having those conversations and does something like this allow for more more time in instructional time and not just remote learning on my own independent learning time. I think that's what I'm hearing you, is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, and the other concern that I brought up at the finance committee meeting is that it's July 28th and we still don't know right. how many families do not have access to the internet, which is yeah. very concerning. And I know that there's gonna be robo calls made and, mm -hmm. and solicited information, but to your point, Dr. Brown, it's July 28th, you know? Yeah. So I think right now we're going to come back to the presentation that's in, fr in front of us um, right now. And does anyone have any more questions about this particular platform that we are looking at right here? Questions in regard to the platform, but I'm sort of on board with Dave. Why, if we're, my idea behind this was that we would have normal instructional days, four days out of the week. Those people that did not feel comfortable coming back to school would have this avenue available to them. I just feel like we're sort of shortening both ends of the stick when we, with this capability, we should be lengthening it. And would this, would this technology allow us to do that? And, and I think exactly, so. Because the idea is to get away from the remote learning. The, the whole deal with the teachers is 
they're having to do multiple platforms. We're going to teach in person. We're going to teach on another platform. This way, they teach in one platform. The other, the kids that are at home, they're, you know, for whatever reason, they're not there. They have the same platform that the kids that are there have. So we're under one platform. The people that are not comfortable being at school have the ability not to be at school, but everything is one thing straight through. And that way, if we do go to the red and we have to go to remote, it's already there. So there's not that much chaos and it's more structure for the student. All right. All right, school committee members. So at this time, I'm going to move to new business uh, without barring any further questions. I think we're going to. Dan, do you have any further uh, questions? Are we voting on this tonight? So in order for this platform, in order for the funds to be used, in order for um, the people behind the scenes to start ordering things like this, we've got to start to really start thinking about making a decision. Um, and so there, it's on the agenda to, um, to make a motion on it tonight. It's pretty hard to vote on something when we don't even have a re-entry plan, though. We don't even know that we are going two days, four days, five days. We haven't even voted on that yet. I would feel uncomfortable voting on this, not knowing what the reentry plan is. Is there, let me ask you this, is there a, um, not you, Dave, in particular, um, but maybe Peter, is there a, what's the lead time on something like this? Well, that's, that, this is one of the conversations we've been having with, with the vendor, and they are getting increasing numbers of orders for these systems, and they said that at this point, the, they would be looking at into the beginning of September before they would be able to do a full installation. They can do a smaller number of classrooms sooner, but he said that, you know, the longer we wait, the more orders are going to be in ahead of us, and so the, the longer the lead time will be. Okay. So whether we, whichever we decide to do, whether it's hybrid, full remote, full school, whatever, this is something that we will utilize in whichever plan we choose. Is that, is that my, that seems to be my understanding, and I may be wrong in that. That seems to be my understanding. If we're red, our buildings are closed, everyone's remote at home. If we're hybrid, we've got the plan of two days and three days with smaller cohorts. We can also utilize this. If we are green, full entry, we will still have some families that cannot access our schools and our school buildings, so therefore they will use this. So this will be used no matter what platform we decide to go. I can see that it being utilized that way. Brian? Well, Peter, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but this can't be used in red. If we're fully remote, this cannot be used Those for, if, it, if, we, if, if we get to September and it, it goes to a full remote option, this, this can't be used. We can go back to Zoom and we can go to. Even if it's October. We can go to the one-to-one -one right. devices, but the video, but teachers this part could, of the video doesn't, no, doesn't apply for red. Teachers aren't allowed in school when we're closed down. If the teachers are out of school and nobody's so allowed in school, this. this Talk us through this one, Peter. We're in full red. We're in so, full remote. So that the answer to that really depends on whether teachers are allowed into the school buildings. Okay. If, if, we're, if, it really, if, if we've gone to that level of lockdown where teachers are unable to come into schools, then, then they wouldn't be able to use the equipment in their classroom. Right. They could still use the platform, Zoom, Google Meet, whichever platform they're using, as long as they have internet connection at home, they could still use the platform and interact with students that way. And if you're if you have no students in class, then the, the room setup becomes less important than it is if you've got 50% of your students in, in front of you. And if you were remote, if a, if a teacher came into the school, she would be the only, he or she would be the only one in the classroom. So there would be no, it'd be maximum social distancing. If they did come into the school, there would be no one there. So you could technically, if you allowed people in the school. Right, but they weren't allowed in the school. Well, they weren't, but that doesn't mean they're not going to be now. Well, if they weren't allowed in the spring, they're not going to be allowed in the fall if we're in red. Yeah, we'll, A leave, lot that of things we'll, leave, leave, we'll leave that one to the school department, to the powers that be, because um, I, I think, yeah, I think it just needs to be left to them. So I just want to make sure I understand this. The $2 million is for this platform, the devices in each in 300 classrooms, the 1,100 devices. Laptops iPads and the key, keyboards, correct? Right. What's the breakdown for this system? So this is um, assuming about $5,000 per classroom. This okay, is about $1.5 million for How this much? system. 1.5 million. Okay, thank you. And we're, we've explored the other options about what we could do with this money, correct? We have explored the other options. Um, I don't want to just not use it. No, I just want to make sure we're using we'll it appropriately. 
uh, one of the great challenges is the very narrow window that we have to spend it. And that, again, we're not going to, unless the department changes its mind, we'll be able to carry over into the next uh, fiscal year. And Adam, please, if I've misspoken, correct me. That's what we've been given. Oh, so to my far. knowledge, you're right on track. And just as an example of something we could not do is hire staff for the year with okay. these funds because it cuts off on December 30th. So it really does restrict the types of things. And so uh, one of the things, the ways we want to think is uh, we have an opportunity right now and this type of opportunity may well never present itself again in this way. So how do we maximize those funds? Right. I mean, I just want to make sure that I don't want to not use the money. If we have those funds, definitely invest in something that we can use. But I just want to make sure that we've assessed all scenarios that we can use the money for. Um, and if, if I might, Madam Chair, I think one of the very real issues that's going to present to us is the availability of getting this equipment into the buildings and that even if we proceeded with all deliberate speed, the likelihood that they could fit everyone who wanted one is probably unlikely at this point. So that's why I had recommended going with volunteers. I think that will, once teachers start to get a sense of how this would work, look and what they can do with it, I think interest in it will grow. Um, but again, the matching that interest with the availability of the equipment may be a bit of a challenge. The, the interest tonight that I have is giving us the, the go-ahead to begin moving forward with this program. Could we prioritize the installation, like what school would get yes. priority? Yes, they, they're willing to work with us on, on more or less any rollout right. schedule that will work for us. And do we have the ability to say, well, th we think we're going to do 300 classrooms, this is it, but actually now in retrospect, we want to reduce the amount of classrooms. Are we committed to the full all or nothing? I can confirm that um, with them. We, the 300 number was one we threw out. We, ha we haven't actually gone through and nailed that down, but I will confirm with him that we will be billed for the classrooms that we install, not for the full 300, even if we don't use them all. Okay. Um, I, I mean, clearly the, the vendor is on the hook in terms of ordering equipment and that kind of thing, so we have to be reasonable and not say, well, we want this many and then only use a fraction of that. I'm thinking starting small, outfitting, and then growing. I guess that's right. an, it's, in my it's, And it's a question of them ordering, ordering the equipment, having it on hand to be able to do the installation. That's the lead time, because they are finding constraints in the cameras, the, the, the air conferencing hub, that kind of thing. Um, and service, do we talk about that already? I know we talked about software updates, service, something goes wrong. Who's coming to service? Is there contracts for servicing this as well? We can check on that. It would certainly all be warranted for the first year, but we can, we can find out what the service would look beyond that. And also, if you can look into how much it will for reinstallation, so with the new EL high school, what that cost will be to bring them from the old EL to the new mm -hmm. EL, just in case that's astronomical, astronomical, something good to know. Okay, so at this point, um, anyone have any more, any further questions at this point? I'm mean, going to ask, are you comfortable? Um, are we comfortable right now? Uh, what's on the agenda is a motion to approve the purchase. Uh, and if no one else has another motion, I will ask for a motion to approve the, the purchase. All right, seeing none, can I ask for a motion to approve the purchase of the distant learning audio and video package and 1,100 devices with uh, CRF funds? Moved. Thank you, Brian Bell. Second. Thank you, Bri uh, Dave Simpson. All right, let's do all those in favor. Seeing none opposed, motion passes. Thank yeah, you, ladies and gentlemen. The amendment to make EL a priority. EL a priority. I yep. mean, this is Dr. Brown's call, but I just think that those. I agree. Kids are just. I think they're right for it. I, yeah. I think they're right for it. Absolutely. It makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Next item on the agenda is the, can we get an update on the East Auburn Elementary School classroom thoughts? So the prior agenda, we uh, tabled a motion, was going to add two classrooms down into the basement. Uh, and so we have shifted thinking, or where have we gone with that? Yeah, so this is an update from last time. Uh, we have gotten the, the, the number on the actual cost of the new portable. I think I had mentioned 67. It turns out we got our wires crossed with Schiavi. That was for a used unit. 
we're looking at this both as a short-term COVID solution, but also a long-term space solution for up to the next 20 years for East Auburn. They've had a space crunch for several years. So the cost of the new two classroom portable with bathrooms is uh, $128,750. We also will have some costs to get a pad put in, have everything hooked up, et cetera. Um, so we wanted to bring this back to you and ask for your approval to move ahead with, with uh, the portable as proposed. And this would also come from the CRF funds. So it would not affect our general fund. It would not affect our CIP funds. All right, any public input on this? Seeing none. School committee members, any questions on this? I have one. Have we identified any other areas where we may need space? Uh, I know that we just finished two other classrooms at Park Avenue. Uh, but what do the other schools look like as far as? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about space if, you know, all 2,000 kids, you know, eighth grade and below come back and say, we're all going to school. Are we going to have room to, or do we, are we going to need extra space? Uh, to bring everybody back to Mr. Simpson's point, we would need more space. We'd also need more staff. We don't have an adequate number of employees to cover everybody, even if I could put a dozen portables at the various buildings. Any other questions? What, what was the other proposal to remodel the basement? Basement. Basement for. It would have been a similar cost, and it would have provided only one classroom. This will provide two, and it'll be a much nicer space. And it's a long. What's the life of a portable classroom? It should be up to 20 years if we take care of it, which we plan to. And it's 145,000 for two. Uh, it's 128,750 for the building, and we added some extra because of all the costs that go along with oh. installing it, et cetera. Got to put it on a cement pad, wire it up. I would imagine it's septic sewer. So these have plumbing. water. These have bathrooms. It does have bathrooms in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any other questions, school committee? All right. A motion to approve the purchase of a modular building with two classrooms for East Auburn Community School at a budget not to exceed 145000 with CRF funds. So much. Uh, thank you, Faith. Second. Brian Carrier, uh, sorry, Brian Belknap second. All those in favor? Seeing none opposed, motion passes. All right, next on the agenda, $90,000 of existing capital improvement uh, project funds to complete the Auburn Middle School front entrance redesign project. Can you shed some light on that one? Certainly, this is one we discussed at Finance Committee on Friday and they recommended bringing it forward to you. Uh, this is the school revolving renovation project at the middle school that we talked about in at length where we're redesigning the entry to uh, bring the uh, the public entry up to the front and have a much more secure entry. Um, the bids came in well above budget. We did a second round of bids and they came in a lot better the second time but we still have a $90,000 gap that we have to bridge. Um, however, uh, it's important to make sure we leverage the 116,000 of funds that the state is giving us to, to do this. And so uh, we're requesting that you approve taking the 90,000 out, out of next year's CIP funds, out of the million dollars that we've been allotted so that we can complete this project. What's the time frame for this project? The time frame uh, is that it is to be completed by the end of winter break. And if we get approval tonight, I'll be reaching out to the contractor to let them know that they can start getting, th getting the ball rolling and see how much they can get done before school starts. We do anticipate the project will, it won't be done this summer. There will be work happening during the school year, but uh, we've talked to Mr. Griffin several times and he's, uh, he thinks it's very doable to work around that and uh, to get it done during the school year. But the end of winter break is the deadline that was agreed to in the bid. So didn't we have a grant that was going to pay everything? I'm a little confused as why we need $90,000 more because we, the grant was supposed to pay for it. So the revolving renovation loan does cover the entirety of our projected budget. Unfortunately, with the way things are going, the bids came in well above budget. And so the, the revolving renovation loan does not cover the entire expense, now knowing what the actual construction cost is. 
Any other questions? All right, seeing none, can I entertain a motion to allocate up to $90,000 of existing CIP funds to complete the Auburn Middle School front entrance redesign project? So moved. Thank you, Brian Carrier. Second? Second. Thank you, Brian Belknap. All those in favor? Seeing none opposed, motion passes. All Thank right, you. ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this evening. Upcoming meetings are listed the 5th and the 19th. I believe we have some workshops scheduled ahead for some of for some of those um so those will be uh, i do, do not have last week's minutes um, right at my fingertips but i believe we do have some workshops coming up uh and some future fall stipends for curricular activities are on here as well as i will look i don't want to hold anybody up but i do believe there was another one but i will look um all right if there are any other items for future agendas, uh, please let us know. If not, I a motion to adjourn, please. One Thank question. You, Do oh. we have feedback on during the stipings from coaches or anything? Will yeah. they be at the meeting? Or? Yep. Yes, thank you. I asked Karen if it would be okay to move that conversation to the 19th for two reasons. One, so we'd have feedback from coaches, and the second is so the MPA will have come out with its rules for the for the fall season the, they won't have that ready for the fifth so that's why it's the 19th okay thanks Dave. uh where are we motion to adjourn second so moved yeah. whatever <laughs> <laughs> all right ladies and gentlemen all those in favor adjourn the meeting thank you everyone the meeting is done 7 12 p.m Lucky ducks. <laughs> you are lucky ducks.
wasn't too bad. So I, I can only time it at noon yeah. in the gym, and how was that for you? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was bad. I mean, I was... All right, good evening everyone and welcome to the July 28th um, Auburn School Department Building Committee meeting. We are gathered here this evening to hear some updates um, from our Harriman people, but before we do that, let's start with uh, introductions. I'll start this way and we'll kind of go around. We have a, a few new, a new face at the table. So Karen Matthew, um, Auburn School Chair. Connie Brown, Auburn School Superintendent. Scott Anier, Principal of Edward Little High School. Sue Marcier, just on the committee. <laughs> uh, Leonard Kimball, community member. Adam Hansen, business manager. Brian Wood, assistant city manager. Holly Lasagna, Ward 1 city councilor and, and I guess appointed to the, this committee. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Lisa Sawin, project manager at Harriman. And I'm Mark Lee, an architect with Harriman. Tim McLeod, Ward 2, City Council. Pam Hart, Ward 2, School Committee. All right, thank you everyone. Mark, we'll let you take it from here. Very good, excellent. Uh, well, th uh, thank you for having us, and uh, now that we're plugged in and, and going, uh, we'll uh, uh, provide everyone uh, our monthly update on the progress of the, the project. Uh, so uh, this follows a meeting that we just had last Thursday, I think it was, with the Department of Education. So this material has been reviewed with them. <coughs> and a few folks from uh, the uh, school department on the call, or uh, yeah, on the, on the Zoom chat with us as well. And uh, so for, for them, I apologize, it's a little bit of a uh, review again, but uh, for the rest of you, it uh, hopefully provides you uh, with uh, some important updates, as well as if you if you have questions, please uh, <coughs> uh, don't uh, hesitate to interrupt, and uh, we'll uh, uh, take a moment and explain things in greater detail or things we may have missed. And so, without further ado, Lisa and I are going to tag team back and forth here, but I'll pass it off to Lisa to start us off. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Mark. So our agenda this morning, or this morning, sorry, <laughs> it all blends together. <laughs> This evening um, is, uh, it looks very long, but it's just a bunch of, of things that we're gonna hit on and, and none of them um, are, are too long. Um, we will have an overview of the geotechnical report. Um, last time we reported that we had just received that, we'll give a, a brief overview so folks know um, what we typically get from a geotechnical report. We'll have an update on the planning board. We'll also give an update on recordation, um, an update on the cost estimate, alternates, artificial turf field, COVID-19, commissioning agent, general contractor pre-qualifications, also known as GC pre-qualifications, uh, filed sub-bids, um, SRO slash safety meeting, and the schedule. And so with that, we'll start with the overview of the geotechnical uh, <coughs> report. And so, um, for folks that have, uh, have been with us um, through this process, remember that the building at one point um, was in a different orientation. So you see the, the blue outline on the screen. Um, and through the geotechnical borings, we uh, determined that the soils were not as suitable where originally positioned, and therefore the building was rotated. Um, and so additional borings had taken place, and then we got our report. Um, solidifying uh, our approach and what needs to happen in the design. Um, and so, the um, oh, I'm going to skip this one for a second and just jump over to geotech and we'll go back to that one. Um, so just a, a high level overview of a geotechnical, the geotechnical report. Um, some folks that are familiar with these, it's, it's pretty typical of what uh, is reported, but just to give uh, ground everyone in what it is. Um, R.W. Gillespie um, is the one that conducted the report and outline the procedures for preparing foundations for the building. So this is what our civil engineer as well as our structural engineer uses to design the building. Um, and we've been working closely with them, so we knew a lot of this information throughout. We just now finally, uh, we now have it in a formal report. Um, and so they talked about re uh, remove all prior fill soil above the historic native topsoil or above ledge. In many areas, this means removing several feet of fill soil or replacing it with compacted structural fill or gravel, before beginning to add structural fill for the building footings and slabs. This over excavation and replacement will be carried as a, what we call a quantity allowance. So essentially what it's saying is, 
in the areas where the soil is not suitable, we're taking it out and replacing it with, with suitable soil. We've minimized those areas by rotating this building. Um, no excavated uh, existing soil can be used as backfill under buildings, and we'll use um, imported structural fill in these areas. And ledge beneath the building will be excavated to uh, six inches beneath the slab and 12 inches beneath the footings. These are all pretty typical um, findings. Um, and for the retaining walls, under drain piping and crushed stone backfill should be used, and they should be at least six inches above the ledge. And the frost depth is four and a half, uh, 4.5 feet in Auburn. So I will go back to um, this site plan that we had on here before. Um, we've talked many times about the greenhouse. Lots of questions have come up about the greenhouse. We just wanted to uh, finally share where the greenhouse is going. Um, so the building, um, uh, as it's rotated, the, um, the parking is in front of the building, and then that orange square you see off to the side of the parking is where the greenhouse will be. Um, we'll provide a, uh, a path um, from um, uh, th that area uh, so that students and, and faculty can get to that. So you can see there's a side, or maybe you can't see, I'll try and use my cursor if it will let me here and get a little pointer. Um, there is a sidewalk on this side here and then a crosswalk to come over here to get on the path to the greenhouse. Um, so that will be the location of the greenhouse. Lisa? Yeah. I'm sorry, was that different than the original plan or this is the first time that we've seen it's it? It's the first time you've seen it. So it wasn't different, it just hadn't been illustrated before. So planning board, good news is we um, got approval from the planning board. Um, first uh, uh, visit to the planning board, we received approval. We do not need to go back to the planning board. We do have a list of conditions. Um, this is typical for the planning board process as well. Um, they list a series of conditions that they want you to meet in addition to what you presented. Um, and so there's about seven or eight conditions and Frank Crabtree, our civil engineer, is. Um, working um, to address all of these. One of the requests was um, there is a cul-de-sac at Forest Ave that is created. They've asked for a light um, just for safety purposes um, uh, to have a light there. So a light will be provided. Um, there were some questions about driveway drainage um, issues with property adjoining property owners. Our civil engineer went out and met with several of the neighbors who had questions and was able to walk them through any questions they have and um, they were satisfied um, with uh, the, the ultimate design and, and how those um, items were addressed. Um, an analysis of revised stormwater plan shall be completed by staff. So they had our stormwater design sent out to Woodard and Curran for an engineering review. We got the comments, I think, the night of the planning board. So they were just asking for us to review those comments and respond. Um, and so that is what is being done at this time. Um, oh, that was really loud. Um, a follow-up traffic analysis um, shall be provided looking specifically at the increase in traffic using the Harris-Auburn Heights access. Any potential issues with site distance at all entrances shall also be included in the report with recommended solutions to be reviewed by staff. So we had the traffic engineer at the meeting uh, for the planning board. So he was able to directly address any of the questions the planning board had. Um, and so he is aware of this and is going back and studying those areas um, that they have asked uh, for additional information. And then the request was that large vehicles, uh, large vehicle traffic access should be limited to Western Ave access of the site. Um, this was agreed as a logical request during the meeting, uh, mostly due to sight lines um, from, from that um, entrance. Um, an addressing plan shall be provided to the addressing officer for the location of the new high school, and I believe that is um, being pursued by the school department um, at this time. Um, and the engineering department shall sign off on stormwater review before building permits are issued. Um, and so again, we are currently uh, working through those comments. <coughs> And an internal traffic pattern review shall be conducted and presented to the staff. So there's just some questions and clarification wanting um, uh, needed on how the uh, student parking versus parent drop-off and bus drop-off and pedestrian circulation were occurring on the site. So we'll provide a narrative that better explains that. 
we're working with Scott to develop that and um, talk about the different uh, traffic patterns that occur and timing of those patterns on site. And then signage at the corner of, oh, there's a typo there, that's supposed to be Fairmount and Harris shall be erected that indicates exit to Court, Court Street in downtown. Um, and the sign will be added to our construction documents. So um, all things considered, um, uh, pretty straightforward requests um, and just uh, will take us probably uh, another week or, or two to work through them and get them back to them and then um, we should be all set. With that, I'm gonna pass it off to Mark to take us through the update on recordation. Very good. And uh, I'll just pause a moment and if there were any questions on the planning board. If not, we'll keep things trucking along. So the, if for, from a permitting perspective, there are really three areas of permitting that we need to do. One is the planning board that uh, we, uh, Lisa just spoke of. The second is uh, the Army Corps of Engineer uh, and their National Resource Protection uh, Permit. And that is what triggered the recordation, as we all, uh, I think, uh, recall the historic nature of Edward Little High School and the need to uh, record it uh, for posterity and so the um, uh, big news on on that is that in fact I received the signed uh, executed copy of the memorandum of agreement between the Auburn School Department and the uh, Maine Historic Preservation Commission regarding the conditions of the recordation so that is now fully executed and so check check that box the next piece of it is actually going and recording the historic assets and, uh, and so the uh, aspect to that is so we, we already have, that's what the um, agreement outlined, what we need to do. Um, we have one quote from uh, uh, Kleinfelder Associates for 25300 um, And the big question on that was uh, where the monies appropriate to uh, perform that service would come from. The, uh, the, the project budget that we're dealing with is the one that was approved at the concept design and uh, uh, that the voters voted on and there's a line item in that project budget for the wetland mitigation which is uh, part of what this whole permitting was part of the the um, uh, for the army corps of engineer and so that line item that we carried was an estimate at the time for one hundred and forty four thousand dollars for the wetland mitigation there's a small portion of wetlands on the site that we're do, doing a in lieu fee to mitigate uh, so that the um, Army Corps has that, those funds available to develop wetlands elsewhere. Uh, and so the remainder of that line item was about $30,000 and uh, because the uh, actual amount that we needed for disturbed wetlands came in lower than what we had, had uh, originally estimated. And so we had a balance there and the state has agreed that that can be used for the recordation process. And so that, that'll be covered under that, which is um, just makes Adam's life a lot easier, I think. And so. Uh, and trying to, f to find where that's going to come from. So that's that's the good news. We're seeking a second quote uh, from another firm to do the recordation process, mm -hmm. and so we should have uh, another proposal to compare against, and then we'll move forward with that, uh, and um, and that will check that box off as well. And so so we already have the um, rest of the Army Corps permitting has already been uh, submitted and uh, uh, being re reviewed. And this is sort of that last item for that. And so the, the last permitting piece is just going to be through code enforcement when we get ready to uh, submit uh, for the building permit. And, uh, and so that will, um, will be coming up as we get closer to the final documents. And so we're, we're in good shape from the regulatory point of view uh, to uh, uh, move forward to the uh, construction when we get to that. Um. How convenient that it, there's $30,000 left in that line. It worked out nicely, Holly. And, and in terms of, so they'll visually record, and then that is stored somewhere for posterity? Correct. And so that, that uh, I believe, gets submitted to the state archives mm -hmm. uh, on it, and it may even get shared with the Department of the Interior. We're going to have to check that out. It has to follow Department of Interior guidelines for properties that would be eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. So, uh, and it's, uh, we, we joked that, uh, you know, uh, we could get students to photograph the building, but, but they have a very prescribed format for it, large uh, plate negatives uh, and, uh, and black and white, and there are very few um, 
approved photographers to do it, and so uh, it's quite a process. But we were, we were, we were uh, happy to see it come in under in the, at the state. It had no problem with us carrying it under that line item. So. And then I'll roll into the cost estimate. And so uh, this is, uh, I think I, I sort of commented the last time in thinking about this, that we're trying to estimate the uh, design at a fixed point, but every hour of every workday, the design is constantly changing. So we're doing the best we can here to, to keep up with it. But this was at approximately our 50% uh, set of uh, construction detailing. And so uh, we sent that off to uh, various estimators. We're actually working with two estimators as well as our internal uh, designers to validate the costs that are, we're projecting for the, the uh, design of the school. And uh, so the, uh, the um, uh, difficulty is in teasing out all the uh, various scope items to make sure they're in their appropriate buckets. Uh, we, we use a divisional breakdown of, of uh, how the uh, uh, project is uh, specified as that, that's sort of the way we catalog all of the cost. In addition to that, we have to then pull costs out for the local uh, costs that uh, voters approved. And so we're working uh, through all of uh, that reconciliation. But the bottom line, we know that right now we're at 103.2 million, and that includes the local uh, costs as well as the, uh, uh, all the state-funded uh, portions of the building. Uh, we, uh, our concept approval was, <coughs> it sort of, it sounds like somebody selling a car or something, 99, uh, <laughs> 99 million, uh, let's see here, uh, 99 million, 543,878. So we're, we're about three and a half percent uh, over uh, the approved funding at this point in time, uh, which doesn't cause us any uh, concern or alarm at all. So we're, we're in pretty good uh, striking distance for a project this size, given the complexity of, of where we're at. Um, and we're looking at ways to trim off that uh, percentage that we're over right now. Uh, we, we still have, in addition to uh, trimming some areas of the design to, to look at some areas we can uh, save costs, we still have another one and a half million uh, in the, a contingency uh, to, uh, to escalate to the bid itself. So in addition to uh, that one and a half million for the escalation, we also have a design contingency uh, to cover things that we haven't detailed yet. So, uh, so all that is still um, in our favor, uh, and we're starting to identify the different items that, that might be um, uh, the great to have but don't absolutely need in this school right now, we'll call those alternates. Uh, and so we're coming up with this list of alternates right now. Um, and so we're very mindful in all of that discussion not to reduce the quality of either the environment uh, for what its intended purpose is or the durability uh, that the project uh, must have in, in uh, order for it to be well maintained. So um, I think that's, that's kind of a, a, a fairly uh, good news when we, when we pulled all that together and we're getting ready, to, as we've progressed our drawings, we've been getting ready to now send out an update and, and the uh, estimators are currently working on the pricing update to that. So, uh, and with that, any questions on the pricing? Um, just So in terms of making the decisions about what will be deleted or refined in some way, you all will make that and then present it to us as sort of a fait accompli, so? Correct, Okay. absolutely. Yeah, one, so uh, one area that we <coughs> in, inherently know that we're gonna be carrying as, a, as an alternate is the second turf field. So uh, that is an item that was um, uh, identified in the project funding mm -hmm. as being carried by fundraising and uh, unspent local contingencies. And so if you all recall, we, the project itself carries um, a 10% uh, contingency uh, split between 5% for the bid uh, at the time that we put it out for pricing and then 5% during the construction itself. Uh, and so that's an approximately almost um, $5 million of mm -hmm. contingency for each of those. Of that, there's a portion that the, uh, is the local contingency, and that's about 600,000 for the bid and 600,000 for the construction for about 1.2 million. So that is, is local funds, uh, and so if we don't spend that through unforeseen conditions and, and the like, that money is available to be uh, put back in for features, or uh, it could be used to uh, lower the overall cost burden on the project. 
So that's one, one item. The other things we're considering are some finished uh, options of, of uh, floor or uh, ceiling finishes and exterior finishes. So. The other items, too, are, are up on the screen. Um, so the second turf field was, was uh, mentioned. Um, and if fundraising is available, it will be executed through that. If on bid day there is um, additional bid contingency, so if the bids come in lower than our S, than our budget or um, you know slightly higher, um, we can use the bid contingency to um, execute that contract. We have about six hundred thousand on local side and about about the same, I think, right, Mark, yes. on the st state side. Um, so. That means if it came in $1.2 million over, we could still execute the contract so we have that much bid contingency. If it comes in right at or below or not that full extent and we have 400 and I think it's $80,000 is the second turf field remaining in that, we could accept that as an alternate using the bid contingency to purchase that second turf field. So that's, that's how that is. I know there was some clarification needed on how that would be um, funded and what the language was around that. Um, the other one is the wand doors, um, and you're probably wondering what is a wand door. <laughs> um, so it's a, a, a door that essentially, when you walk in the building, you don't even perceive is there. But in the event of um, a, a lockdown, or you want to close certain areas of the school off at the end of the day or during public events, it's a door that comes out of a pocket across and closes off a section of a building. Um, it's both from, a, it's great from a user standpoint, also a safety and security standpoint. The alternative is a solid wall with some double doors. You lose that sort of openness and that open feel of the building um, uh, that we've uh, worked with everyone to design. Um, the other one is landscaping and hardscaping and courtyard. And so the idea being that this is one area that can be done later. Um, it's not integral to the building itself. Um, if we need to reduce some cost, um, it's easier to come back and plant plants at a later date or enhance features around um, uh, the landscape. Um, and then the theater system is another one that we're looking at. Um, the uh, what is uh, essentially in the proposal from our consultant in the theater uh, projects group. Um, I think there's some areas that we can uh, reduce um, in order to get it uh, within a more reasonable number. Um, it's, and, and look at areas to where we can cut back on, on some of the items there, um, but definitely not impacting the overall theater and the performance of the theater. Um, and we're continuing to think of other things as we go as well. Other alternates will probably come up is if, um, we want any proprietary items. So everything needs to be uh, competitively bid in the state project. And so we need to have a, a product and two equals. So three things that somebody can choose from so that it's competitive when we go to bid day. Um, if there are items like security cameras that are tied into the city network that you want as proprietary items, the state has us list them as alternates so we can see the difference in cost from the competitive bids if somebody else comes in with something. If it's an upcharge, sometimes they, what they'll do is they'll ask that it be locally funded, the difference between those numbers to get that increase so it can be proprietary and tied into your city system. Um, another thing that's come forward is card access. Um, both of those were items that came forward from um, the fire and police chief um, uh, meeting we had the other day. And as we go through this, we will talk about prioritizing alternates. We don't have to have them in a hard and fast prioritized list, but we do want to have an understanding as to where the committee is at in regards to a priority. So when we do, when we are at bid day and um, hopefully we have the good fortune of being able to select alternates, we know what those priorities are so that we can represent um, what the community and the, the building committee would like to execute as alternates. Can I, um, the theater system you talked about, what are you considering cutting down, like the amount of seats, or what is it that you're looking at? So there, there are three primary uh, subdivisions of the technical uh, portions of the theater. There's the uh, audiovisual, and then there are the rigging line sets, uh, uh, and then the lighting. And so right now, the estimates that we've got back from the design that's been provided are over what we originally budgeted. It's just I think the, 
the uh, quantity of circuits, lighting circuits and things like that are more than what we normally would put in. So it'll, it, it's not going to change the amount of lights that you could use in the theater or the quality of the sound system itself. It's sort of bells and whistles that we have to dig into and sort of uh, get it back into what is uh, reasonably expected for uh, the quality of the system that uh, we need to furnish the space. But no, it, it's going to be the full 1,200 seats and, uh, and the full functionality of a full fly and uh, a full audiovisual system, lighting system. So uh, it's just a matter of, of fine tuning the design to get it within the budgeted amount. Okay. Thank you. The next item um, is on artificial, artificial turf uh, informational meeting. And so there was a meeting um, that uh, uh, was uh, conducted with several school department staff and, and Harriman, uh, Frank, our civil engineer, um, was there. Um, and it was really looking at uh, the different infills um, for uh, the turf um, and the um, there were three types presented um, for consideration, uh, three types of turf, I guess you should say, for consideration. Silt um, film bonded fi fiber, which is the most economical. Silt film and monofilament dual bonded fibers, which is somewhat better. And the woven iron turf, um, exclusive, tougher product and most expensive. The infill choices include a standard SBR rubber, a coated SBR, um, lower contaminant release, and an EPDM rubber, lower contaminant product. Um, so the attendees at the meeting uh, indicated a preference for the two inch Tenkata XPS 52 ounce silt film since it was a dense playing surface for multiple sports and was most economical. The attendees were concerned about perceived health issues surrounding standard uncoated SBR rubber infill and expressed the preference for the EPDM. Costs were presented for one color standard field, um, multicolors, embedded lines and logos carry an increased cost. Um, essentially what it breaks down to is if we were to execute the, um, the preference that came forward, the cost for the standard shock, uh, sorry, the um, I might be misspeaking here, and I apologize. It wasn't at the meeting. So those are the preferences, and then the cost for the standard shock pad is approximately an additional dollar and seventy-five square feet, dollar uh, seventy-five per square foot, which equals one hundred and ninety-two thousand five hundred added to the cost above. Um, and so the vendor was concerned turf subcontractors would have a difficult time holding prices for three years after the bid opening. So it's a very uh, detailed summary of that. I don't know, I know a couple folks here were at that meeting. I don't know, Scott, if you wanna uh, elaborate on uh, any of that information. It, it, was, well, it was incredibly informative and the, um, the, the vendor was able to answer every type of question, fully understood um, any type of concerns we had, uh, showed us the various um, products and the benefits and the downfalls and the cost differentiation on each of those. Um, and we even got into the specifications of the, the lining of the field and, and what that all looked like. And, we really tried to take a very um, middle of the road, um, safest, most durable, most usable approach with the products that he brought forward. Um, and we were able to compare that to different venues around the state to try to get a deeper understanding of what that looked like at Lewiston, what that looks like at Fitzpatrick, what that looks like at some other venues in the state. Um, and it, it was a very informative process. And again, when we got down to it, it was uh, to be very fiscally feasible, but very conscientious about the durability and um, how long it would last, how usable it would be for multiple um, events taking place on all of that, and really to be as conscientious to the safety concerns as possible. Uh, and and he was incredibly informative of the, all of those pieces. And so um, in terms of the infill, which is, you know, we, we hear that story out there of AstroTurf causes cancer. Well, it, it's not that, it's the infill that those studies have been had, that have taken place. 
and the, the conclusions to that, and this is coming from a person who used to sell sod, so he was an arch enemy to turf, and then realized that this is a better product, and it's a, and it's a, and it's a better, product for the consumer than it was for the for the sod uh, so he was very neutral in all of that um, and that's what led us to the encoded infill um, as, a, as a means of really trying to be sure that we were honoring the safety of our students and the users of the field um, there's various degrees of testing that go on for that it's a heavily heavily tested um, industry uh, it's very heavily scientifically uh, produced. Um, it, there's no flim flam to it. <laughs> like, and one of the big pieces, I, I know it's at the bottom, but it's, it's crucial to any surface is that shock absorbing pad because although we spend a whole lot of time talking about what happens with uh, our legs and our knees and things like that, uh, that shock absorbing pad is crucial to the whole project because that's really where, where your head hits the ground and that is another major industry study that they do. Uh, and, and so again, we tried to take what is the most feasible, the most durable, uh, um, and usable and safety conscious approach when we looked at, I mean, those were major filters for us. Uh, so we didn't go for the, the top of the line and we didn't go for the bottom. We went for the middle and the safest in, in every aspect that we could. Can I have a couple questions and Scott, probably you can answer them. I'll do my best. I'm not okay. the vendor. You're not that guy. <laughs> I'm not that guy. He's good. <laughs> oh, the um, multiple colors, embedded lines, logos, increased costs, is that exorbitant? Is it? It, it can be. Um, there's some base models that go with it in terms of not just the perimeter, but how you um, line the inside. And so there's some models of of painting versus stitching on them. And so we, we had some debates about that. And again, I think we took the very middle approach uh, so that it provided some flexibility. And then from some user use, with too many lines on there permanently, it gets very confusing visually, not only as a spectator, but as a participant on the field. So again, we tried to hit the middle of the road there. And as you add those things, they, the costs escalate pretty quickly because right away we're like, we want a giant red eddy right in the middle. And we're like, oh, maybe, maybe not so much. Let, what would that look like? And so as Frank and the vendor were working on the cost, we, those were pieces that we didn't need to define at that moment in time. We talked about having some different colors in the end zone uh, that is a, wasn't exorbitant in cost and was pretty comparable to what we've seen in other venues. So again, the vendor was going to put some packages together for us to be able to see what the costs were and what it actually looked like visually. But we did hit that middle of the road and, and, and again spoke to other venues to see how that worked, the, the stitched in versus the painted in lines. Like we're going to want some that are permanent and then we're going to want some that we adjust season to season. And in terms of the um the crumb infill how what's the maintenance on that like you have to redo it every once in a while correct yeah and i don't worry if you don't know the details i just it is something it is and again with the material that we were looking at it was um the maintenance of it again wasn't any different in the material but there was some maintenance pieces and we talked about what we've learned from other venues specifically Lewiston we've had a lot of conversation with them and how they have um, managed that whether it was winter or spring and there were some other variables like there's some um, organic matter and uh, the deluxe organic matter is probably the one that you would want to jump to the most um, in terms of making sure that you're safe on an infill, but that stuff, the term was migrate. So if you have rain, it kind of has the tendency to wash away. And so then you're back to having to refill it again. But then there's another organic material that you could use that uh, doesn't migrate as much and that's new to the industry. And so there's still kind of, people are excited about it, but they, they still haven't seen enough of it because there's only one in New England, um, one of the, New England schools down in Massachusetts that is, um, has a pretty pricey admissions fee, you know, those kinds of things. So as we looked at all of those factors, we, we kept coming back to 
most cost feasible, safest that we could, and durable. And so in terms of the infill, they, they all kind of fish out to about the same. Mm -hmm. um, and some, instead of it being five years, it's seven, and others it's three, but then you'd have to make sure that you're, you're doing some other ongoing maintenance and that cost is up here. And, and so again, what's the most feasible all across is, is the mindset that we took. <laughs> And this is my last question for this, is they, um, are you going to be able to extend the season by plowing the field? Well, it wouldn't be so much extending, it would be <clears throat> trying to start earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we typically look at our fall and our spring sports, our fall sports typically can end well. Um, but then, and again, we talked about some of those pieces of um, our, if we go late into the fall, how... Um, the temperatures could go down and so that's something that we needed to consider with some of the turf itself and how that responds to cold weather um, and in the same lens um, in the early spring what would we need to do if we needed to plow it and how do you how do you do that without it being um, destructive to the actual material uh, and again we've spoken to Lewis and we've spoken to some others not me per Todd Sampson, our athletic director, was doing that. And Frank has had a lot of experience with many of these projects through the state. And so there was some good resources for us to kind of tap into to get a sense of what that is. So that if, if we did take that approach, uh, if we needed to, that we weren't damaging the field and adding cost to it. Go down the middle one. They, yes, in some, in some aspects of it. Um, and there are some things that they have shared that they would have done a little bit, a little bit differently here and there, and that some of that would, in some parts of it brought the cost up, and others that they would have brought the cost down. So it was it, nice a, they did it first. It, it, it is, and it and it gave us some some good um, knowledge to be able to that they were willing to share and for us to be able to do. Uh, and the other piece that they had is that their funding source was much different than ours, so it kind of gave them a little more freedom to be able to do that where we needed to stay within some constraints. Uh, but again, we went with feasibility, durability, uh, and the safety aspect was huge. That was a, a major consideration for us. I, I, seriously, when they talk about the, the studies and the analysis that they have on everything, it is, it is really very impressive and, and I, the piece that was most important to hear through all of that was, uh, and I put him on the defense. I'm like, well, you're a salesman. Of course you're going to sell me this stuff. And he walked all the way through with that saying, you're not the first or the last to share these concerns. So let's put them on the table and let's talk about them. And he brought a lot of scientific information. Uh, but that shock pad is really significant. It's what goes down underneath that really enhances the safety for performers on the field. And again, we took what is the safest and most feasible and what is pretty much the, you know, the typical approach for uh, what's happening underneath the surface. Thank you, Scott. Um, one, one thing to, to mention is the, um, the standard shock pad was not part of the original estimate at concept. So that's something, I hear the importance, but something we could look at putting as an alternate um, hmm. so that it could be added to the project. Uh, it was never on any, radar. when we talked about yeah. it, it was never on the radar. I was like, wow, that's really important information and a really important part of the project. Yeah. So we can definitely uh, uh, discuss that with DOE um, and get some feedback on making that an alternate so that hopefully we can fold that into the project. Any questions on the artificial turf informational meeting? I should say additional questions. They're all great questions. Um, so COVID-19, I'm sure we all have talked about that at length. We also talk about it in the construction industry, um, keeping construction sites safe. Um, and so just wanted, and also what are we incorporating in, in the project um, at this time? Um, and so just making sure things like um, touchless fixtures are incorporated um, in the building from uh, toilets to lavatories, um, or uh, inv the DOE has asked us to investigate touchless water fountains. We have the the, uh, the water bottle fillers as part of that, but they want to see if we can maybe take that a little little further. Um, we do have language in our specifications around um, 
the um, contractor and providing us a plan um, as to how they will address uh, maintaining a safe job site. Um, and so what we're seeing right now is um, different contractors have plans that are very similar. They're following CDC guidelines as well as OSHA guidelines um, where they do um, uh, check-ins with the, the staff when they come on site. They ask them to remain masked. They ask them to practice um, distancing if they're not masked. Um, they also, uh, we've seen temperature checks that's kind of gone away a little bit, um, but they definitely have forms and they're tr uh, tracing people through the building. So in the event something does happen, um, they're able to uh, mitigate that um, or at least inform people appropriately. Um, the other thing is we're investigating should there be additional language in the event that a, um, a case or even um, an outbreak that were to happen on site impacts the construction schedule. Um, what, uh, how is that um, handled and uh, how is that essentially um, mitigated? If we have something and a, a crew is out for 14 days, you can imagine that has an impact on the schedule. Um, so those are things we're exploring um, right now with the Department of Education um, to uh, see what makes the most sense to put into the documents. And commissioning agent, we have a commissioning agent on board. <clears throat> so we had six, I believe, um, uh, I keep thinking it's seven, but it's six commissioning um, proposals submitted. Um, we had a committee that got together, reviewed those, ranked those, um, and we conducted interview of Sparhawk, and they were a great fit. Um, they have given us their proposal. They are under budget. Um, and we are looking at some of the, um, what they call additional services um, uh, that could be added on. And essentially what these additional services are, are additional visits through the process or additional tests um, uh, that they can do throughout the process. We are pushing back a little bit on, on some of the base um, bid. We think there needs to be a little bit more building envelope testing during construction. Um, for anybody that doesn't know what commissioning is, um, and CXA, if you ever see that, that's the acronym for commissioning. It is uh, a third party who evaluates um, the basis of design, so essentially what the owner and the school has asked for from a performance standpoint of the building in, re in regards to the systems, that's so mechanical, electrical, plumbing. We've added in, um, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, we've added in uh, looking at some of the safety and security systems, so the lockdown function of the building, um, as well as building envelope. Um, and so making sure the building envelope is performing as designed. Um, and so what it does is it's a, a second set of eyes on the contractor making sure things are executed properly, that when they do their flashing it's not leaking, um, and things like that. Um, highly val valuable. Um, and we'll continue to uh, work with them on their proposal so we can get that executed and they can start reviewing the drawings. They will review the drawings, um, the 85% set that was sent out. They'll provide us a list of comments. We'll work through them. Um, and um, we will uh, then do it again at 100% to make sure everything is dialed in. This is just a little bit more detail on what those additional services are. Um, so quarterly remote monitoring. So for the first year, they'll log into the system. They'll work directly with Billy for a year to kind of troubleshoot the system on a quarterly basis to determine um, how are things working, what things might can, can we fine tune um, throughout the process to make sure um, uh, that everything is, is well oiled. Um, and then additional commissioning site visits of having them come out to the site to do um, additional reviews or again, additional um, envelope testing um, on the curtain wall. Filed sub bids. Mark, you want to take filed sub bids? Yeah, so I early, uh, uh, back when, when we were discussing, uh, um, well, actually, I thought we were doing GC pre-qualification, but file subs. So, uh, so what, what file subs are is that we break out certain components of the work into a um, separate division that is priced. Uh, and so, for instance, all the heating, ventilation, air conditioning uh, systems, are, we ask uh, for that to be broken out and, and that the contractors submit a price just for that work uh, 
and instead of it just being given to the general contractor or a general contractor and, and you never really see what that value is, the uh, filed sub uh, makes that uh, publicly known prior to the submission of the, uh, of the um, actual uh, uh, bid itself. And so what that does is it protects certain trades uh, from what sometimes uh, happens with uh, pressure to reduce their price in order to get the project. And so uh, if there are uh, multiple mechanical contractors and they give their price to uh, the general contractor and the general contractor comes back and says, well, if you want it, you're gonna have to be at this. And so that, that uh, back and forth sometimes happens even after the uh, project's been bid. And so this really protects uh, filed uh, sub trades uh, in that way. And so, so, and they're standard in, in the state of Maine, these are the ones that are listed, are the pretty typical uh, items that are filed sub. And so it's, as I said, there's mechanical, electrical, uh, or the mechanical, um, the electrical is, is all the electrical systems in the building. Um, the site is all the site work uh, and plumbing. Uh, uh, and so, and then drywall is the other one for, um, uh, for various reasons is a large enough division. And, and we've seen other breakouts as well, but the state has said that that's, um, that's a good enough list that they have seen used on other school construction projects. And so that's the list that we're gonna be using on this one. So um, the... Um, there, may, there may be others as they review the estimate a little further that they may come up with others. It's a pretty large project, so sometimes um, uh, we'll have larger numbers in some of those divisions um, or, or trades, if you will. Um, than you typically would, so we may see some that we typically don't see as well. The, the challenge is finding one that you can clearly put in a box. Uh, so we, we had trouble once where we put <coughs> doors and, and windows. Well, the glass in them uh, sometimes is carried in different locations, and so that became a challenge. You gotta really clearly define it. It has to be uh, something that is, is clearly defined so that everyone, uh, you're, you're looking at apples and apples when the pricing comes back. So the SRO safety meeting. So we met with the police and fire chief um, and the police chief uh, was representing the needs of the SRO within the school. And we talked about um, our approach to safety and security. We talked about gen in general, the, the, the project itself um, and some of the um, conversation that was had and some of the outcome of that meeting was around um, security camera and card access, asking that to be compatible with the city system. Um, uh, Knox box located at the entrance, which is a, a very common um, uh, uh, item that we incorporate. And request for community entrance to have SG glazing um, as well. And so what SG glazing is, it's called school guard glazing. And so essentially it is a glass that has a, um, a rating to it to where it takes a certain amount of time to get through it. Um, so uh, we have worked with the state to come up with an approach that they use on, on many schools, but the glazing is SG4, so it takes six minutes to get through this glass. Um, and essentially in a safety and security um, approach, it's about um, slowing down the event so you allow time for um, intervention. Um, and so that is one feature. they. Uh, the police chief and the fire chief asked that we look at putting that at the community entrance as well. Um, we're in conversations with the DOE and we need to circle back with uh, fire and police to discuss um, how we might go about that. Um, they also request to harden the SRO office. Um, and then we talked about panic button locations, um, how we have those um, dispersed throughout uh, different locations in the school. Um, alarms on exterior doors so that if a door is left ajar, there is an alarm sent to the office so that you're made aware of that. Um, zoned PA system so you can have different messages communicated to different parts of the building depending on what the situation might be. You may have a different message to one side of the school because something's happening there and a different message to the other side. Um, so the other one is floor pattern. Um, and so what we've done in the school is in the classrooms, at the doors. Um, you stand at the door and there's uh, uh, some glazing to the side and so you um, position yourself in front of the door and you literally look inside the room and you have a cone of vision. And where you can't see in the room, we draw a line on our floor plan and we essentially change the color of the floor. 
so that when you're in that classroom, you know where in the room you're out of the line of sight from the corridor. Um, so that makes it uh, a little simpler to, to act quickly. Um, and then uh, they made the request to eliminate pulsations, uh, which essentially we, we have done at this time. Um, and that is uh, the overall summary the, of uh, SRO and safety. Question that came up when we, we presented. Excuse the, me, oh, what's a pull station? A uh, fire alarm pull station. Okay, so there'll be none of those? Correct. Okay. How oh, come? Uh, because what the studies have shown in the past is a lot of these events, um, folks will get into a school, and the quickest way to get all the students into the corridor is pull the fire alarm. I did. It, and that was <clears throat> when, when many of those pull stations were, were built into schools, we didn't have the advances in uh, sprinkler systems that we do now. And so it, 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 it's almost like a redundant thing, and that was the recommendation from police and fire. Like, is it really necessary in those spaces because of the advances in sprinkler systems? It, it served a purpose at a time when we didn't, that wasn't um, such a, a powerful tool in fire prevention. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the codes have, have changed to allow that because Scott's absolutely right. The entire sprinkler system acts as an initiation to the uh, fire alarm system. So uh, in addition to that, there are heat detectors and smoke detectors throughout the building uh, as well that initiate the fire alarm system. So. You're, you're very safe uh, in the buildings. Why? Those Why? panic buttons are there. How, how, how are the panic buttons? What are they? Oh, how many? Well, how, many? how many? Uh, I'd have to count them up in my head. Right. Um, just curious. Just There's probably, uh, I would guess, 10. The other, the other thing that the, the state uh, questioned was uh, the degree to which uh, you harden beyond the main entrance. And so, uh, in conversations with the, the state, uh, that sort of uh, is where they've drawn the line in their funding of uh, schools in the past, is that they'll, they'll harden around that primary entrance. And the question then is, you know, where, where do you stop? And, uh, and so, uh, again, they, they are scrutinizing the effort to which we're expanding beyond uh, that. Um, and, uh, and they're just, they're, they've... Um, uh, from a hardening standpoint. From, from a hardening point of view, yeah. So the idea of the using school guard glass beyond the primary entrance is one area where they, uh, they have not funded that at the state level in the past. And so they just wanted to make, make that clear. Uh, and uh, the SRO office as well, uh, adding uh, school guard glass in that particular room was, was also uh, identified as something they haven't funded. Why would you do that? Why would you or would you would not? Would you. What would be the reason for hardening that SRO office? Yeah, I think, I think there, there's um, a, the sense that uh, if that um, person is a facilitator of first response to provide an extra level of protection to that uh, location, and so that uh, sometimes we've seen in school designs where that office can even function as a command center in an incident, and so the idea of creating some more protection around that location. The, there was some thinking that the, the chief provided that if someone was to make their way into the building to do harm, that that may be one of the first locations because that would be a first responder in the building, that they would, they would seek out that and where we have it kind of centrally located within the building on the second floor, uh, he asked that it be a consideration um, because, as I said, if someone's seeking to do harm, they may um, come to that location first. But if it's on the second floor, they're going to have to go through the main office. Is that going to be protected? Yeah, so, so the, if you all recall the design, the, there's that security vestibule right at the main entrance yeah. with the uh, administration adjacent to that. And, and the, actually the wall between the vestibule that you come in, that security vestibule, and the administration area is actually rated with ballistic glass okay. and armor core uh, uh, wall. Uh, uh, protection. Yeah, Armor Corps is like a, almost like a Kevlar system in the okay. wall. And what's a Knox box? A Knox box, it, essentially it's, it's a box that uh, has a key in it for them to be able to get into the building. So some, sometimes, now, now you'll start looking at things like we do. There's a little black <laughs> box next to the entrance of buildings. And so if you, if you, in public buildings, if you go and you'll see that, it's just a little, like, you know, this big and you will have a little K on it, you'll notice yeah. it, and that's where all the keys are stored in there so that first responders can come. They have a universal key to get into the Knox box to get access to keys 
through the building. So. Oh, cool. Glad I asked. <laughs> are the panic buttons, are they easy to find, I guess, is what I... For the people that need to use them, yes. Okay. Um, so a lot of times what we'll have them is if uh, the, or not if, the um, administrator who is checking people in through that secure window, there's one right under their desk. Yeah. Um, there's one in the principal's office. Um, we distribute them throughout the building as well in, in areas, and, and if there is concern to where students may know where they are, they do have a, a, a guard over them so they're not easily bumped into as well. Yeah. Okay. It, it's a delicate balance of making them accessible, but not too accessible. I know, that's right. <laughs> I don't I advertise them. <laughs> yeah, here I am. <laughs> we will not announce where they are. That's right. Very uh, careful not to say where the other locations would be. Need to know basis. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I can see kids now. Any just, other questions? I had a quick question yeah. about the floor pattern. Yeah. So I understand the reasoning behind having the cone of vision into the classroom. Uh, is that going to be SG glazing glass on each side of the door as well? No, it's not. So what it is is um, in the door we don't have glass. We have glass uh, to, to the, the side, side of right. it, and then the wall is right there. Um, the studies that we've seen in instances like this is typically don't enter the classroom. If the door is left open, they may fire into a classroom, or they may, if they can see someone through the glass, maybe fire through the glass, but they typically never enter the classroom. They're trying to move quickly, unfortunately, to do the most harm. And the studies that we've seen is those individuals out of the line of sight have survived um, in these instances. And so that's where the thinking comes from. And it's become a pretty universal practice in architectural designing for safety and security. Thank you. And that's, that's when stay in place is, is the strategy. There's yeah. also, in all the classrooms, we provided doors between the classrooms so that uh, they can actually move without entering the hallway to move through and find uh, an alternate route to uh, leave the building. And, and the pane of window beside the door is on the opposite side of the handle. That was, oh, yeah, that's good. That was a part of discussion. I don't know where that is in the design phase, but right. I just really appreciated how thoughtful and mindful that thinking was. All good conversations. Well, not good, but good, good to have. strategy. Important. <laughs> Important strategy, let's put it that way. It's sad that we actually have to do this and that we have to put that, but it, you guys have done a good job with, it seems like you've checked off all the boxes. One other question, safety in a very different way. Do you need to rethink any kind of the air circulation because of COVID? So right now, uh, there's a couple things that we're doing that actually uh, are coming forward as recommendations with uh, COVID practice. And so one of them is the, the type of dis uh, ventilation, that, the pattern that, that we do is, is mm -hmm. displacement ventilation. And so that's uh, actually um, a recommendation coming forward. Beyond that, um, the idea that you're going to have uh, a, a very well-functioning uh, system that provides the recommended amounts of outside air, and you can actually modify the degree of uh, outside air that you're bringing into the, the facility, but uh, that's an important aspect that uh, a lot of older uh, school buildings, uh, the systems have uh, either never been set up for what we now consider appropriate levels of, of ventilation or, um, or that they've, those systems have deteriorated over time. And so, um, so in, in those aspects, we're, um, we're meeting the requirements that we're seeing come forward uh, from ASHRAE. But it's, it's a hot topic right now because everyone is, is evaluating that and understanding is UV treatment uh, a recommended practice or not and how effective is it and how, how, how do filters impact that. That will play forward as we get a little closer to going on mm -hmm. to uh, the final design specifications. Any other questions before we move on to schedule? All right, schedule and next steps. Um, so again, the overview, uh, we're, we're zeroing in on the end of that 21 step process for the DOE. Um, we are in the fall uh, when we get to the State Board of Education, um, uh, fall 2020, um, which essentially, I'll, I'll jump to the next slide. So the um, the State Board of Education meeting will be scheduled for Thursday, November 11th, will be when we're at the State Board. 
Um, and essentially that's the last sort of approval that we need before we go to bid. Um, and at that point it should really be a technicality. We should have gone through enough reviews with the DOE, the, build, the, um, the state construction committee um, to have all the boxes checked. Um, and so then from that, it's packaging up any, if they have any questions that we need to dial in, we'll get those put in and we'll be out to bid. Um, right now, targeting November 17th would be the bid, um, put it out on the street for bid. Um, so that means our documents are up to the state October 14th. So what we call our final review set is technically what it's called. Um, we'll go up October 14th. Uh, it has to be there two weeks ahead of our state construction committee meeting, which is Friday, October 30th. And then that correlates with the Thursday, November 11th board, um, uh, state board meeting. Um, and so, uh, that uh, pretty much uh, aligns with uh, our schedule of having final funding approval. So essentially after bids are open in the new year, um, we sit down with the DOE and we, we finalize the funding. So we look at, okay, where did bids come in? What alternates were accepted or not? What bid contingency was used, wasn't used? And we finalize all of that. Um, and we are um, underway and the building is scheduled to be complete in 2023 with the um, existing building to be removed in 2023 and the site completed in 2024. So you can all pinch yourself or really get to that point. <laughs> I know. Um, and then general contractor pre-qualification. So what that means is we pre-qualify the general contractors that can bid on this project. You can imagine a project of this size, there's only certain contractors that are qualified to bid on it. And so the state has a prescribed process for, for doing that. Um, we advertise, so we'll start working with the DOE in the middle of August to start pulling together all the information, and then um, once we've, we feel we have everything, we'll advertise, we'll start to receive um, uh, contract information from contractors, and they'll go through the pre-qualification process, and then we will have a list of those contractors that we can accept bids from on bid day. And that is the end of our presentations. Any questions from anybody? Do we have any other public information sessions? I mean, I know that we're far along, but just to let people. That's an excellent, excellent question, Holly. We, we don't have anything scheduled, but I think it's something maybe as, as a committee we want to think about and uh, when would be another appropriate time to update the community on, on where things are. Uh, I think, um, oh. yeah, and, and the best, best method for that at this point, it, uh, uh, it's getting the word out beyond simply people tuning into these types of meetings. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I know that the, you know, the, the planning board um, was a, a public process that, that provided a small amount of update, but not really sort of a global update on where the design of the, of the school is and, um, and the scheduling of how it, when it's all going to take place. So that's an excellent question. We'll put, put that on our uh, list of things to can keep uh, and it might help support the fundraising if people actually begin to see and hear about the turf field and what it's going to look like. And yeah. <clears throat> All right, any other questions? Yes. Um, so when things go out to bid, uh, maybe we've asked this before, I apologize if we did, but do you just accept the lowest bid or is there any sort of discretion in, uh, in choosing who you choose to uh, hire? Yeah, so, so Leonard, the, good question. You know, do, do you just accept the low, low bid? Well, because we're going through this pre-qualification process, uh, we'll, we'll have suggested that all the contractors that are providing a price have the requisite qualifications to undertake it. Uh, the only thing that, that sometimes happens is if you have three contractors that provide a price that, that's uh, 95 million, uh, and then you have one that provides a price that's 90 million, you, you gotta make sure that that person that provided that really low price hasn't missed anything in their, uh, in their bid. And so mm -hmm. we may evaluate their bid and confirm that it has everything in it. 
they're actually, they have to submit a bid bond, uh, and when they submit their bid, that um, uh, is used to cover if they have to pull out, that that bond is intended to provide uh, a delta between going with a low bid contractor and the next contractor. Uh, and so those are typically in the amount of 5% of the bid. Uh, and so, so there's, so I guess the simple answer is y yeah, unless there's some really uh, uh, strong reason why that contractor's bid is not, not valid, uh, we would at that point go with the low <laughs> bid. <laughs> like you. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? All right, seeing none, thank you, Mark and Lisa, for joining us again tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you all. <gasps> Actually, gonna ask. Yeah. Huh? Just this